I thought we'd start with the unword. Um, I was when I read the matter with things, and it was lovely seeing the interview again. It's, you do need to watch these interviews more than once, I think, because uh, they're so dense. But I was really struck by this idea of an unword. You know that you need a word that references something beyond your ordinary mind, your everyday mind, your egocentric mind. You need a word that we might use, a transcendental and so on. That you need a word, otherwise it drops out of discourse. It means that you forget that there is something else. If you don't have a word for something, then you forget there is something to move towards. But he was saying, if you have a word for something, it, you make it think it's a something in the way that you want to. I have a pigeonhole, a place for that, and a, uh, you know, a marker for that. So we need a, a word that is vague enough to point to something beyond everyday consciousness, is perhaps how I might say it simply. Um, but if you make it too clear and too exact, it becomes another thing that you can you know, make a space for in everyday consciousness. But watching it again, I, I did feel more and more uneasy about using God as the unword. Um, for me, you know, I was brought up in the Church of England and I can't think of God separate from, you know, a person in the sky, a judgmental, authoritarian God. Um, I, I, so I wonder, I thought we might start with God, unusually. Um, I, I, I really felt that he was right about the need for an unword. I think that's right. I, I felt I thought that was a very good insight. But I wasn't convinced about God as being that word. And I wondered what you thought. And then let's see what what we could make of an unword and what unwords we might want to use and where's the strengths and the weaknesses of, of it. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think um... You're right about the need for a word. He's right, Ian McGilchrist is right, about the need for a word. I, I particularly think um, uh, our secular culture, if, if I can generalise about our culture, our more sort of secular nihilistic culture, if there isn't a word, the default is that there's nothing beyond, beyond consciousness. consciousness. So I think we do need pointing. to be pointing. Uh, with something. It's a shame that he just didn't stay with the word unword, mm. which is such a good word. <laughs> and, and, uh, it's a shame. Shame. And um, I wonder, I mean, I too think it's a sh I mean, I don't have such a problem with the word God, mm. but I think it's a shame because it's a word that is so um, problematic for so many people. I think it's a shame that that's what he sort of gravitated to. Because when you read The Matter With Things, particularly when you read that last chapter, which is what I was interviewing him about, his use of the word God is not how you typically encounter that word. Uh, I think, I mean, he uses it in that mystical way, doesn't he? Yeah. He's talking about Meister Eckhart, he's talking about the Kabbalah, he's talking about Sufism, he's talking about mystical traditions of theism, but also about Buddhism at times. So I think God, presumably for him, is used in a very sophisticated way. Hmm. Uh, I, yeah. I, I was reminded of about, about um, uh, well, a while back, you interviewed Rowan Williams, who was um, hmm. the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, and uh, I met Rowan Williams at an interfaith kind of, uh, well, it was a Christian Buddhist dialogue. And uh, Rowan Williams was talking about a, a, a Christian mystical perspective on Buddhism, on the Heart Sutra, actually, on, and on the Metta Sutta. And everything he said, I thought, oh, yeah, I could agree with as a Buddhist. And I felt a little bit like that with Ian McGilchrist. Mm. But somebody sitting next to me at that, that um, talk, who was a Christian, said, He'd never heard God talked about like that. Mm. That's not what you hear in church. That's mm. not what you hear, presumably, uh, in in popular Christianity. So I think the word is just problematic. Mm. Uh, and I'm so, so glad that, um, I don't know, Buddhism, particularly Bhante, has just been much, much clearer about how you can point to uh, a transcendental reality. You can point to something beyond our ordinary consciousness, our ordinary mind. 
without taking the pointers as literal. Because as, as soon as you try and point to something beyond this world of me and you, of, of grasper and grasp, of subject and object, you're in the language of metaphor, aren't you? Because mm. language is, is mm. in that dualistic realm. And Bhante's just been so clear that you're, um, you're using words as metaphors, whereas Christianity and the theistic traditions generally, I think, tend to fall into a more literalistic, maybe Buddhism does as well, but it's more dangerous with theism, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and God becomes a literal thing. Doesn't have to. I've, I've, I can remember reading Karen Armstrong's um, uh, Karen Armstrong is a is is a is a thinker is a is a, um, a writer um, and she wrote this um, book called The Case for God and um, again she's very poetic and metaphorical and uh, intelligent hmm. but but I think it's just now too problematic a word to use it's a shame hmm. it's a shame that he, he hmm. sort of resorted to that reminded me a bit of when I met. Bounty, not that long before I died, he died, you know, he, he was saying, no, no, you can't point at reality. Oh. And he said, um, but you can hint. Oh. And, and uh, I said, that's what you've been doing, isn't it, Bounty? He said, yes. Yeah. You've been hint you can only hint yeah. at something yeah. beyond yeah. duality. You, know, yeah. you can only hint at something yeah. beyond egotism. Really. Yeah. yeah. And, and God, for in the popular sense, not maybe in the Ian McGiltrist interpretation, but in the popular sense, as I understand it, and I'm not not theist and I haven't really had a Christian upbringing, so, you know, I could be wrong. But for me, in the popular sense, how it... He, he, he's still in this dualistic realm, mm. easily, and, and, and just becomes the big object. So, so we can never become God. We can worship God. And God might offer us salvation, or He might punish us if we if we're if we're disobedient. But we can never become God. So 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 God is still outside of what we can be. He's the ultimate object, isn't He? Mm. Uh, I think. Mm. Uh, so that that that's just not Buddhist. That that that's that's a real kind of um, stumbling block. In, in Buddhism. But of course, that's not how Ian McGiltris meant it. I think he meant it much more sophisticatedly than that. I mean, he was talking in the other interview about God being, our idea of being God being a left brain idea of the, the, right. the huge, you know, mechanic who's built it all and knows how it all works and has a slot for everything. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think that is much more like the God that people usually imagine. And, and, and particularly when... Um, I don't know how many people this applies to these days. Maybe we've got some ex-Catholics here. If if God becomes um, uh, a, a notion that then triggers guilt or fear, uh, it's just so unhelpful. Mm. So so unhelpful. Guilt particularly is mm. unhelpful as well. I mean, at the, at the same time, I do think that there was one thing to be said for God. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, let's hear it. Go on. <laughs> obvious place to be talking about it. Um, one of the things that, just as we're talking, one of the things that perhaps brings to the fore, if, if we were to think of an unword, they've all got strengths and weaknesses, and we, we've got lots of unwords, the transcendental, the non-dual, the absolute, Banty used to use the absolute quite a lot, um, dominium of processes is Sabutis. Three unwords. Three unwords, <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot of unwords. Um, uh, the value of... Uh, value of, as it were, God as an unword, is it feels more personal. Yeah, right, yes. You know, if you say reality, yeah. or the transcendental, or the yeah. absolute, or the, particularly Dharma near the processes, yeah. it sounds like you're, you're, you're opening yourself up to, I don't know, electricity, or, yeah. you know, um, yeah. the, the metaphor of God, and I, I do think it's, for, for me, it's a dead metaphor, I, I just don't think it's usable anymore. Yeah, yeah. But it, it does bring to the fore that your relationship with whatever's mm. beyond self, to use that language, mm. isn't abstract and absolute mm. in this sort of like the, a snow mountain landscape that's beautiful but distant. Mm. 
is also intimate. I don't know whether... Well, it's hard to imagine Dharmanima processes loving you. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it might sort of uh, tell you off or something. But then... <laughs> <laughs> might get plugged into this. Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that might be why Ian McGilchrist has used it, mm. because uh, I think he's trying to say there is something uh, of the nature of consciousness about reality. And if consciousness, as far as we sort of experience consciousness, it's always personal. Mm. Uh, Bante has talked about suprapersonal, hasn't he? Mm. And... Uh, uh, Technically, that gets closer, mm. but it's hard to know what that means. Mm. So I can imagine that that's why he's used the notion. Fortunately, we've got the Buddha. Mm. So, so you know, this afternoon, Sir Badramati was uh, evoking the Buddha through stories, and uh, or this morning, and we were opening up in our imaginations to the Buddha as a presence, as a as a as a force of love. Mm. Uh, we do need that. We do need that because otherwise, how do we? Otherwise, Buddhism becomes very abstract. And last night, I think that's what some people found it very abstract. You can have great philosophy and not be moved by it. Yeah. And and then if we're not moved by it, I don't know if we'll act on it and uh, whether then it has any purchase on us. Mm. It might for some people. I think, again, for somebody like Ian Mil McGilchrist, I think he's a practitioner. He's mm. not just an abstract thinker, although his thinking can be uh, just brilliant. I mean, I think the man is a genius. Uh, but I think he lives it. Um, he, he said he meditates. Mm. Uh, meeting him, he, you know, he came to dinner before those interviews. You just get this sense that he's not just talking about the importance of humility. There is real humility in him. Mm. Uh, there is this sense of wonder and awe at life, at experience, at, at uh, just being alive, mm. uh, at, at reality, whatever that is. Uh, so he's he's not that. But for many of us, I think we do need something much more personal, as mm. you say. Uh, which which takes me a little bit to. I, I wonder whether you know, to follow this idea of personal because. We're only related by the personal, in a sense. I know that there's much more to it than that, but it takes me to this the, the, the fact that when we're ordained in our tradition, you're given a sadhana, you know, and in a way, only up to a point, but that's your kind of, could you say that's your personal connection to the goal, you know, to something more like Ian McGilchrist is talking about? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And it's, I think it's part of Bandy's genius that he has been a, he's been able to be um, I think as clear as Ian McGilchrist is about right view yeah about um, uh, um, you know not falling into um, extremes of nihilism eternalism but he's, he's he's clarified so much in the Buddhist tradition in a way that I can't imagine any other teacher mm. in contemporary times doing uh, and he's offered us practices that are very personal, intimate. Mm. Uh, he's, he's offered us method for transforming ourselves. And yes, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the archetypal Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Shakyamuni Buddha as a, as a, as a figure, as an archetype, uh, we've got ways of um, connecting to, well, to enlightenment through them, mm. through images, through the person. Mm. And, and, and Arlok is very um, keen on this, isn't he? Mm. He's saying that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they, they personify enlightenment they, because, well, they, they need to be um, imaged as persons because personhood is the highest category mm. that we have for value. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, so we can talk about goodness as a value, but actually we only encounter goodness in persons. Uh, similarly, you know, truth in a way. Mm. Uh, persons are very, very important for us to relate to meaning. Mm. Uh, so I think the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas personified move us. You know, I, I, um, my, my sadhana is, um, 
well, currently what I, 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 I visualize um, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, Manjushri, Manjushri or Manjudosha, uh, who, you know, is this radiant amber orange color of the, the sun, uh, holding the perfection of wisdom as a text to his heart, and in his other hand, a flaming sword. When I visualize him, what I experience is his love. Uh, I don't experience him um, giving me a commentary on the Heart Sutra. Uh, I, I, I feel uh, uplifted through his love, but that love that I, I experience also has, um, it has, it has the flavour of wisdom. I don't know what, how else to put it. The taste of wisdom or something. It is like that sort of the development of the personal, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that, that what you say about oh, okay, it comes from the survey, Banty talking about person as being the highest category. Right, yeah. um, we tend to think that sort of abstraction is a higher than people, you know, like, yeah. oh, person, but then above that, there are these sort of snowy ranges of, yeah. of, of, of philosophical talk. Yeah. I'm very struck that Banty says that person is the highest category and that that's what we relate to most deeply. It's what we relate to most deeply in life here, but at every level, perhaps. And, and, and the challenge in Buddhism is to keep that personal, um, the ideal as personal, or maybe more than personal, yeah, but not less than personal, mm. to keep that in view and to keep that in, in mm. heart, mm. because a theistic tradition I come from a Hindu background, a theistic, you know, polytheistic. You've got many gods, although they're, you know, all incarnations of avatars of uh, Brahman. But a theistic tradition doesn't have that same problem. You mm. can, you, there's lots of ways to kneel and worship and bow and, uh, and, and so forth. Buddhism, the danger is that it can just become too heady. Mm. and and uh, abstract mm. and even teachings that are core and key to buddhism like uh uh no self uh i mean even those words they become so heady mm. uh you know because we can easily think oh person doesn't matter because what buddhism is telling us is that self is a construct so suddenly mm. you've just gone into abstraction very very quickly mm. So I think Buddhism, Buddhism is particularly um, needs this. But you know, it's, inter uh, it's interesting you mentioned non-self because I was, I was think that was in the back of my mind. You know, why not just think? Well, let's just see through self. Why, you know, why do this visualization of the of the Buddha like we did today? Why, why take up the Mandragocha study sadhana? Why not just see through self? Is, is that not the same thing from an, another perspective, you know? I guess it might be for some people, mm. but I think for others, I think it just becomes um, uh, heady mm. and overly cognitive. Um, so, for example, uh, a modern psychologist, you've, we've probably got psychologists here, might also agree that self is a construct. Mm. Uh, a neuroscientist might agree that self is a construct. That doesn't mean that they've opened up to radiant mm. wisdom and compassion mm. and what lies beyond this realization that ah, my, my sense of me is constructed. Buddhism's not no, non-self or, or, or no self or anatta is not the end point of Buddhism. Mm. It's a way in to realizing uh, something vast, uh, a mind that's vast, awareness that contains uh, love and freedom and energy and beauty. Uh, so if, if somebody's experience of non-self opens up into all of those things, great. Mm. But I'm afraid sometimes it doesn't. Mm. I, I'm afraid sometimes it remains rather uh, technical sounding. At least that's my mm. experience of it. Mm. Um, mm. Buddhism offers spritual death and rebirth. Bantis emphasize spiritual death, which would be a realization that self is a construct. But that is only meant to be, I think, a doorway into spiritual rebirth, which is a transformation of our small mind into vast mind. Maybe transformation is not the right word. Maybe it's an opening up. Maybe it's a, it's a falling away. Mm -hmm. But this vast mind that the Buddha symbolizes, that 
Ian McGillchrist is pointing to, I think, mm. uh, that's surely the, the, the key thing. It's just it's difficult to talk about. Yes, we can use words like beauty and wisdom and truth. Even they feel abstract and mm -hmm. it's difficult to talk about. But it's it, Buddhism has to be an experience. So Bhutti was recently saying this when he was talking about the nature of mind, that Buddhism is concerned not in the end with philosophy, it's concerned with experience. The philosophy, the right view, might help you get somewhere. Mm. The Buddha wasn't ultimately concerned with the fact that self is a construct. Mm. He was concerned with opening us up to a, to a vast experience and saw that clinging to this constructed notion of self, to me, stops us from having it. Mm. You lost the words. <laughs> <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> yeah, let's, I, I, was gonna, I was wondering whether I might uh, carry on with it, but let's change tack a, a minute. Because the other, the other thing that I was very, very struck with, I don't know whether other people were, but I was very struck by uh, Ian McGilchrist's talk about resistance. Matter as resistance. Matter as resistance. Of course, it's, it's important to... Remember, he's talking in a sort of specialised way about matter. He's not talking about, I don't know, resistance to meditation. He's you not know, talking about emotional resistance. No, no or, not at all. Or, um, uh, uh, or, or as Vidyamala was talking about the second dart, that we yeah. might fire at ourselves when things are painful. Hmm. He's not talking about that sort of no. resisting experience. So I, 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 if you clarify that, then you, you sort of... I was really struck by that as being very suggestive. I thought his metaphor of the the vocal cord was very yeah, striking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's the resistance, in this more technical sense of, you know, the, literally the mat, matter resisting the the, the 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 breath that creates sound. And I wondered. I mean, this might be a bit of a leap, but see where what you think. But um, I wondered whether that might start to take us into, for us, questions of rebirth that if consciousness, you know, the B Buddha says that mind precedes world, um, Ian McGilchrist is arguing, it seems to me, the same, that consciousness precedes matter, that matter is a state um, of consciousness. Um, perhaps we're like, you know, this, these pebbles in a stream, the vocal cords that create this particular stream of consciousness that is me, but we're part of the same stream, you know, that you and I have got you know, different lives, different histories, different sort of structures, both literally, physically. I mean, we're both... No, no, forget... <laughs> Let's just stay we're with... Stay we're, different. Yeah, we're different. <laughs> we've got similarities, yeah, we've got but we're similar different. Differences, yeah. <laughs> we're very different. Yeah. <laughs> You're blushing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pause for a moment. Uh, before anyway, we, you before we go on to rebirth, okay. though, I think it might just be worth explaining what I think he meant by yeah. resistance. Because yeah, yeah. uh, we've said he doesn't mean emotional resistance. Yeah. Or, or... Yeah. I, I, the way I took it, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand what he's saying, but it evokes something for me. We, we've been talking on this retreat about uh, us being crystallizations or condensations uh, or coagulations of uh, a, a life stream or an energy stream, uh, a bit like you're saying about pebbles in the stream. Mm. And uh, I think what he's saying is that form itself, matter itself, atoms and everything that atoms make up are maybe like that. They're crystallizations of mind, my words. Uh, uh, condensations of consciousness. Uh, maybe that's what he's saying. Uh, and, and, and yesterday, he, when we watched the interview, I, I was struck that he said that these condensations, these crystallizations, if that's what it is, matter, mm. slows things down. Mm. Uh, and, and that that's important for creativity mm. to, to arise. But but just to go back, I mean, I studied physics and I studied physics a long time ago and I know physics might have moved on and, and so forth. I studied it in the 80s. We've got more contemporary physicists in the audience. But at least one interpretation of matter that quantum physics 
gives us is that it's 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 like energy. Uh, everything, you know, nothing is solid. Uh, matter arises from energy. It crystallizes out of energy. It can dissolve back into energy. And also, what quantum physics, at least um, one interpretation of it, seems to say, is that um, those those tiny little particles, those subatomic particles, seem to be aware of when they're being observed. Mm. So, so now not all physicists will agree with that interpretation, but. The, the other interpretations are, are pretty outrageous as well, as far as I know. <laughs> so it's not like, well, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody in the audience, but it's not like um, common sense reality uh, is given any uh, validity in, in physics. Hmm. Common sense reality of this is a solid table existing objectively from our experience of it in time and space that is also objective from our experience. That common sense reality was um, demolished in the early 1900s in physics. Yeah, so that's a hundred and something years ago, it was demolished. Mm -hmm. So the extraordinary thing is that that common sense reality, of course, has such a grip on, our, on us that even though science has told us that it's not real, for over a hundred years, we behave as if it is. Yeah. Mm. So, so when he says matter might be a condensation of energy of of mind, mm. it, it's no more outrageous than some of the things that physics comes up with. You know that we're living in an eleven-dimensional universe, or or a multiverse, or 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 any number of. Uh, outrageous kind of theories. Reality is weird. It's strange. Mm. Uh, and the, the, I, I don't think it's so important that we get to the to the f final answer. I don't think we ever will anyway of what, mm. what, what, what's going on. Mm. But I do think it's important that we try and shake off the common sense perceptions. Because what Buddhism says is that, that it's that common sense perception that I'm in here, I'm a real me in here, and this is a real table out here, uh, independent of my observing it. It's that common sense assumption that stops us from opening up to this vast, enlightened, free, blissful, compassionate mind. Yeah. So that's really, really important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really open to a scientist like Ian McGilchrist sort of questioning our common sense assumptions. That's mm. what I love. Mm. Uh, and, and, and great that he's saying that um, matter might be um, a manifestation of consciousness. Mm. A state of consciousness. A state of consciousness. Mm. Like he said, ice is mm. a state of water, uh, a phase of water. A phase, that's A right. phase of water. Uh, and, and, and we, only because we're so used to water becoming ice and w ice becoming water. Do we not think that that's miraculous? Mm. But, but actually everything is kind of incredible. So why shouldn't matter be a phase of consciousness? It would certainly explain why an electron seems to know that it's being observed mm. or it would be consistent with that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So resistance, you, you were asking about um, rebirth. Well, slowing down of, well, what I was thinking anyway, I mean, this is slightly maybe to mm. the left of what you were saying, but I was thinking of the Devalokas. So Buddhism talks about lots of different realms that beings can uh, exist in, beings can be reborn in. Mm. The human realm being one of them, but only one of them. There's, there's worlds uh, like the Devalokas <clears throat> where beings are made of light, and uh, uh, they live in this kind of heavenly world where, you know, they move just by thought. They communicate just by thought. Everything they wish for just appears before them. They're, they're, in a way, there isn't much resistance, mm. if any. Mm. Do, do, do you see what I mean? There, there's nothing. And I kind of think, oh, that's what I want. I want <laughs> <laughs> next time round, please, can we have some of that? <laughs> 
but the interesting thing is that that what what Buddhism teaches, what the Buddha taught, is that it's very hard to gain enlightenment through a devaloka, because guess what? There's no resistance, oh, so there's okay. no need to strive for uh, uh, liberation because you already feel you've got everything, mm. and you you forget that there's such a thing as enlightenment, which is more than that. What's more, you forget that that devaloka life is temporary. Mm. Yeah. So, so you, you become complacent. So it's said that the human realm offers us enough dukkha, enough suffering, but also enough relief from suffering. Mm. This is, a, of course, a huge generalization, but it's said that human life generally has that combination of uh, suffering and joy woven finely enough for us to start questioning uh, uh, what, what life's about and then maybe moving onto the path mm. that frees us, whereas a Devaloka doesn't. So resistance might be really, really important in that sense. And resistance seems to be essential to in learning anything, doesn't it? Yeah, learning mm. seems to be, I mean, I don't know if Bante explicitly says this, and maybe you can correct me, but certainly watching some of these interviews on people who have had near-death experiences, they seem to imply, because obviously people have come back to life, they seem to imply that we're here to learn. Mm. We're here to learn. I mean, that's, what, that's why we've taken form is to learn and and many of them seem to say that that learning seems to be about maybe this is like precipitous to say what it's about but i'd like to sort of suggest that it's about learning to love unconditionally to 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 uh, um, to empathize to to be free of our self-centeredness uh, of course maybe that's that's wishful thinking but i suspect that that's what human learning really is about it can't be about learning uh uh particle physics quantum physics i knew you were gonna say that <laughs> it, it can't be about learning that it's got to be about learning something about consciousness isn't it mm. uh, uh growing our consciousness so resistance having a body that doesn't fly at the you know just because i i think i i want to fly somewhere doesn't even work properly uh having being in a world that doesn't give us everything that we want being in a world with other people who we can't control and who won't uh, always accommodate themselves to our wishes maybe that's the best ground for learning maybe mm. i mean i don't know mm. it's an opportunity anyway isn't it mm. it's an opportunity I mean, and I wonder whether the other wonder about that, I'm sort of circling around rebirth in a way, but, you know, in the Tibetan tradition, it said that you choose your parents, you know, um, and I've always been a bit sniffy about it. I thought it seemed a bit ridiculous, you know, you're hanging around waiting for which parents to choose. But I wonder whether it's somehow saying that the life, and this, this might seem unjust as well, but that the life you've got is exactly the life for you to learn what you need to learn. I, I've always had that instinct that that might be true. I don't know what that really means or whether there's really ground for that in, in Buddhism. But um, in I have that instinct. Mm. I have that instinct too. Bante talks about, um, and he's talking metaphorically here, doesn't he? But he talks mm. about the gestalt, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, of yeah. our lives. Yeah. As if there's um, <clears throat> a patterning outside of time and space for, the, for our life. Mm. Uh, uh, um, and yet we're trying to discover that, remember that maybe. So maybe there is for each of us a life that we should be living. Again, maybe it all just sounds too, too sort of woo-woo, but I, I suspect that we kind of know when we're living the life that we should be living. Uh, things feel like, well, we feel more fulfilled. We feel more like ourselves. Uh, we also know when we're not living the life that we should be living. Um, I was, I hope this isn't too indulgent, but I, I, I can remember a dream that I had once a few years ago. 
one of these big dreams. I don't have big dreams very often, but you know, some dreams have a quality to them that they're not ordinary dreams. They're not ordinary kind of consciousness. Well, in this big dream, I was shown my life. I mean, the whole of it, from my birth to my death, the whole of my life as an arc, a bit like um, Dickens's Christmas Carol with Scrooge <laughs> being shown. You know. Anyway, hopefully mine was a bit more happy. <laughs> uh, and then I was told that I would forget it on waking up. And then I woke up, but I remembered that I'd been shown it. And I remember that I'd been told I was going to forget it. And I, I knew that I'd seen it. So, and that mm. stayed with me. And then a voice came and said, remember, you're here to help people. Mm. So that's, that was an odd kind of uh, notion, but it's, it stays with me, that dream. Uh, and, and particularly when I, I experience a lot of resistance of the other kind, do, do you know what I mean? That doesn't want to get out of bed in the morning, that doesn't want to come on retreat and teach and give talks. And I experience a lot of that. I get over it. Thanks. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but, but I need such sort of clues, do, do you know what I mean? Even if they're not literal mm. truths, I need those sorts of imaginative um, aids that, oh yeah, life is about something and my life is about something and I'm trying to discover what that is. I mean, Bounty is this wonderful uh, image in, I think, a seminar about, of unro uh, un unrolling a Persian carpet you know, at first it, you just see all these chaotic sort of, you know, different colours and shapes and lines, and it doesn't make any sense. But he says, if, as you live your life deeply, as you unroll it, it starts to make more, the whole pattern of your right, life yeah. makes more and more sense. But that um, does mean living it deeply. I think a, a lot of us get stuck with the chaotic pattern. And he, he, he also says, doesn't he, in that, I think when he's in that seminar, where, you know, when you unroll, it'll be imperfect because we haven't lived mm. the, the pattern perfectly. Uh, uh. So there'll be um, cigarette burns on the carpet <laughs> and, and um, you know, tears and, and so on, mm. because we don't always live the ideal life. Mm. Uh, so, so, so that's there too. Mm. Yeah. Let's, I, I want to, in a moment, I open to some to questions from the floor, but one of the things that struck, you know, this is, in a way, this retreat is a culmination of uh, the nature of mind. We're still we're not sure whether we'll be able to continue or not. But it, so looking back through the interviews, including uh, what those wonderful conversations with Ian McGilchrist, one of the things that strikes me, valuable though it's all been, and I think for me, and so many people have said to me they found it very, very valuable, that there's still an issue that near nearly all of them, but basically they don't offer a, hmm. a path. Hmm. It's striking with Ian McGilchrist, you want to say, so what do we do? Hmm. And he's quite resistant hmm. to that question, he even says, that, that's not my job. Hmm. I'm trying to give you a new vision, I'm not trying to give you some sort of hmm. handy hints hmm. for how to live. Hmm. And I, I, I respected that, hmm. I think that's quite right. Hmm. But to make any progress in life, hmm. I, I believe you need a, a mm. pragmatic path mm. that you can actually tread, mm. and you need a community of people who are treading that path with you. Mm. I wonder whether mm. that's your sense of... Oh, yeah, very, of very much, very, very much. I think, um, uh, in a way, meeting Ian Medill Chris, and it was a delight to meet him, and I hope to meet him again. Uh, part of me just wanted to say, you know, come and join us. <laughs> 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 you know, because here we have a community. I know we're not perfect, but we're aspiring to be the sort of community that he's, that, that holds the ideals that he's laying out. Mm, uh, mm. Uh, I don't know if he knows that yet. Mm. I mean, I don't know how much he knows about us or, 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 or Buddhism. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm too sort of uh, polite yeah, to, to say, to, to say, mm. to say that. But I feel very, very fortunate that, I mean, I, I felt I was a Buddhist before, you know, I was in my teens when I, just through reading some books, but I didn't do a thing about it, mm. a thing about it. In fact, I just got really frustrated because I didn't have uh, a community. 
or anybody to show me how to live or, uh, uh, or a path at all. And I can remember, you know, reading, I don't know, several books on Zen and one day getting so angry, angry that all these, um, uh, mysterious truths were being talked about, these koans and, you know, I just threw this book against the wall and broke its spine. Mm -hmm. It was like me saying, just stop it. Stop telling me about Buddhism unless you can show me how. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't until I came to Tri Ratna and you were leading a retreat, I came on, uh, and I thought, ah, yes, here are people who are actually doing it, people mm -hmm. who are actually... And, and, and then I can do it because others are, they're like me doing it. Mm. So I don't know without that. Maybe you've got geniuses like Ian Medilchrist, like Bante, who managed to do it unaided. I mean, Bante had teachers, of course, but Bante didn't really have a sangha. No. He, he seems to have um, found his own path and own way with guides, with teachers, but, but rather on his own. Uh, he even apparently said that he never thought he'd experienced anger until later right, on in the right, in the movement. He, right. he really thought he'd never experienced anger yeah. in his life. So, so it's possible, but it wouldn't have been, I couldn't have done it, and mm. I don't think most of us could. Mm. Yeah. It does seem to me to be one of Bante's many, many geniuses, is that he's created a, a vision of the truth that isn't God, for me yeah. that's important, yeah. but also isn't isn't just a kind of, um, I don't know, mental gymnasium. It's not atheist either. No, it's, it's, not, it's not secular it's not, and atheist. It's, Bantu's vision isn't secular at all, it seems no. to me. And, but, so he's done that and, and, and explained it in great lucidity. And he's created um, so a pragmatic path that you can actually tread. I remember, you know, the, in this Nature of Mind book, the first piece we've put in it is uh, Mind Re Reactive and Creative. I remember studying that with Dom Ratti, who lives here, mm. you know, um, when I was uh, 25 or something, and being absolutely blown away by that. At last, there was a vision that I could, mm. um, I could aspire to mm. that didn't have God, actually, mm. for me, because mm. uh, I never believed in God. Mm. But then, yes, created a, a path and a community. Mm. And yet a community is a difficult thing, isn't it, to create an international community. Mm. Can you say anything... About that? No. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say one more oh, thing. Yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Maybe I'll come back to that. But I, I do want to say it, it's really interesting reading Ian McGill Chris and meeting him and interviewing him um, because I think there's so many similarities between his vision and Bante's yeah, so explanation of the Dharma. So many parallels. And so many same references. Sometimes. So many same references. Bante mm. is not a scientist. He wasn't a scientist, but uh, in terms of um, all the cultural references, the philosophical references, etc. William James, Coleridge, Wordsworth, mm. etc. Mm. That, that there's so many similarities. But one of the things um, I find is that Bante makes it very accessible. Uh, Ian McGilchrist is, is, is um, uh, a, a genius, but he's also quite difficult. Mm. In, in a certain sense, to read and, mm. and to um, absorb. And I know Bante can be as well, but goodness, when Bante gives talks and things, they're so accessible. And one of the things of encountering Ian McGilchrist is that I think, ah, sometimes I take Bante's thought for granted yeah. because it's so clear and so accessible. And I, I kind of think, oh, yes, well, that's kind of obvious. But then somebody like Ian McGilchrist says, oh, matter might be... Uh, a manifestation of mind, and you think oh, that's 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 really exciting. Mm. But actually, Bante has been saying that all along. You read the three jewels, the Dharma section, and that's what he says. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, so sometimes I think we, well, I can get um, complacent about what we've been given. But in terms of community, I know you want to say something about international community. It's difficult. You said it's difficult. It's difficult, isn't it? Because when we're, we're um, well, one of the reasons it's difficult, I think. John, you want to say something, <laughs> no, don't no, you? No, no. <laughs> you want to stop me? No, no. Uh, um, one of the reasons it's difficult is because uh, uh, we're not perfect. We're not enlightened. Uh, we've got unenlightened people trying to work it out together. Some people having more experience of the Dharma than others, but still being imperfect and flawed and trying to work it out. Bante, for me, was the most enlightened man that I've known, mm. uh, but he was still working it out. 
Hmm. And uh, that's really hard to form um, a sangha around flawed, but idealistic human beings. Uh, and to create structures, I think it's 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 relatively easy when you're on retreat, although not always easy on retreat either, mm. living with each other. But you try working together. Mm. <laughs> uh, you mm. know, you try building uh, a, a retreat center or running a Buddhist center together. Mm. It's hard. Yeah. And yet, without it, the whole thing breaks down to for me to little YouTube clips. You know, yeah. you, YouTube. Yeah. You, you know, you, in many ways, you know, if you if you want. Buddhism as information, you, you're better off with YouTube. Yeah. You know, what I think one of the things about is so opened up is Sangha yeah. and a path for Sangha. Yeah. Yeah. And his emphasis on friendship. Hmm. I used to think when I came along, I kind of thought friendship was, um, oh yeah, great, important, really needed. And I felt very grateful for well, your friendship, other people's friendship, friendship that's helped me practice. But I think I did see it rather in utilitarian terms. Like it, friendship was needed, community was needed in order to, for me, to mo move towards enlightenment. Mm. Uh, and, and gradually, gradually, I feel that's shifted for me. And it feels like friendship in this Sangha I've got so many friends now in this community all over the world. That feels like, for me, the richest, the, one of the richest boons of my life and feels like that's worth living for, that's worth practicing the Dharma for, so that I can have deeper friendships. Mm. Uh, that's, that's, Banty's always said that, hasn't he? Or something. It brings us back to person again, doesn't it? Yeah brings us back to person as the highest. And, and the enlightenment, well, yesterday, anyway, Ian McGilchrist in the interview yesterday was talking about relationships coming prior to um, Relata, to Relata the, mm. the things that relate. If reality is more like he's saying, then it consists of relationships. Everything is about relationships and, and, and flow. Mm. not about the things. Mm. The things are just abstractions. Mm. That seems true, doesn't it? Mm. So friendship rather than... Friendship sort of exemplifies, exemplifies that. Exemplifies that, yeah. In the human realm. Yeah. So let, let, let's open this up now, just see what, whether there's um, any questions from the floor. There's one straight away from Adam. Um, you know, we're, we're saying that matter is condensation or precipitation of, of consciousness. So, what other states of consciousness might <coughs> there be? Then? And also, how does the dream world fit into that? Because you mentioned that is that a dream, dream or dream state? And what other states might there be? So, yeah, let me just read. So, you a yeah. different. You know how many other kinds of consciousness might there be, and and the relationship of dream, the dream state. Well, Buddhism is saying definitely that there are other states of consciousness, other than our normal um, everyday consciousness, our everyday mind, and we know that through meditation that we can access other states of consciousness. Uh, um, and 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 also what Buddhism says, say say you take a dhyanic state of consciousness that is, um, you know, very blissful and free. But as I'm saying that there's a, there are worlds that correlate to the states of consciousness. Mm. Uh, um, so the, the world that we occupy, the world that we experience is correlative to the, the level of consciousness that we have. So mm. we've got human consciousness, I have, you have, and we live in a human kind of world. If you dwelt more and more, if we dwelt more and more in dhyana, that would correspond to a more uh, deva-like, god-like world. And, and maybe we would find ourselves experiencing the world more in those ways. And then after death, maybe that's where we would be reborn. So there are lots of different levels of states of consciousness. Dreams are a... Are a 
at a state of consciousness, aren't they? What Buddhism is saying, though, is that all of those states of consciousness are still mundane. They're still uh, transient. They're still dukkha. There's still rebirth. We're still on this wheel of life, of birth and death. But there is a state that's beyond that. And I don't even know if you can call it a state of consciousness because it's no longer um, our consciousness. Uh, there is a state of complete freedom that isn't in time and space and, and doesn't, doesn't therefore, uh, isn't transient in that way and is completely fulfilling. Uh, and that that, I'm going to give a talk tomorrow, so I might talk to, try and talk a little bit more about the nature of mind from a dharmic perspective. But that liberated state is said to be our own potential, our true potential. Uh, so, so yes, I don't know if that helps. Thomas? On the back of that, does it mean the Gurkhas have like a conception of the potential of enlightenment? Or is it just kind of talking about it abstractly? Like, this is what the divine sort of is like. But you know, does he mention you know, we can actually access this? Is that, is that part of his vision? I think he's certainly saying that there are different modes of attention, different modes of awareness that he then correlates with the left and the right hemispheres, and that you can develop these different well, you can develop uh, these 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 modes, and he's saying that the right one is is very underdeveloped in our culture. Uh, I he he talks doesn't he about ways to truth, um, and and two of those are um, imagination and uh, intuition. Intuition. Mm. Uh, I think he's saying yes, you can develop them. He's saying well, in the, in in the previous interview, he was saying some of the doorways like nature, uh, uh, art, are, are ways into developing um, them. Uh, so I think he does have a notion of growth and development. He's, he's, he's definitely, like last night he was saying, human beings are not the fixed final point. He's an evolutionarist in that sense. And he's saying we're, we're on the way, we're evolving, we're not finished. And that's again what Bante says, that evolution in in the biological sense has brought us to human form the next journey the next stage of evolution is evolution of consciousness and i think ian mcgillchrist would agree with that mm. yeah i don't then know whether he has this notion of what we would call enlightenment just going on from that because i think it might be good to clarify again is is because i think it's very important in his thinking is that um how you see the world creates the world or co-creates yeah. the world. Yeah. I think we still haven't really got that under our belt. Yeah. I think we tend to think that, oh, I have experience, good, 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 positive, negative, neutral, and I've got some views about it. Uh, yes. He's saying, no, no, your view creates the experience. It forms it, it shapes it, it edits your experience to fit your view as you go along. I wonder whether there's more we could try and... Because I think that is very, very important and really backs, you know, Bant has spent a lot of his teaching life trying to help us understand what he means by view and how views shape experience. And I think this Nature of Mind project is, is in a way, you and others attempting to bring that home to us a little bit more. Mm. Uh, this retreat's an attempt at that. I don't know how much we've succeeded, but... You know, we've been we've been doing quite a bit of meditation on the retreat, and then we've been having these talks or interviews or whatever in the evening, and I'm not sure that we've completely brought them together mm. in a way that completely sort of makes coherent sense. But the idea of these talks and the meditation is just what you're saying: that views are really, really important. They will shape our experience, including our meditation experience. So sometimes we think, oh, I'm not having a great dhyanic experience in meditation because um, I'm sleepy or I'm just not up to it or something. But we don't always say, oh, I wonder what my worldview is mm. and whether that's stopping me having a dhyanic experience in meditation. Mm. And it might be. 
Yeah, it might be. Mm. Uh, or, or Subhadra Mati this morning was inviting us to imagine the Buddha sitting in the presence of the Buddha. For some of us, that had a that had a that had an effect. But all we've done is change our view, mm. and then our experience changes. Mm. And I think you're right. We don't in in our culture. What's happened, I think, is that study and views have got compartmentalized from how we live our lives. Mm. Philosophers in in the in the Western tradition sort of see it as a academic thing. Mm. A lot of them, not in medieval Christ, mm. but. And then they live their lives as normal people. Mm. Do, 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 yeah. So, so whereas I guess ancient philosophers, it wasn't like that. Philosophy was a way of life, mm. and that's more how Buddhism sees views. So these things that we're discussing, they're not, they're not just um, irrelevant. Mm. Sometimes people say, "How is it all relevant? All this talk about the nature of reality, the nature of consciousness, the nature of matter and mind, and is that relevant to me? When, when really, I just want to be happy." Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. If you really want to be happy and really fulfilled, then we've got to look at our worldviews. And I think part of that is that people don't realise, and I think I haven't realised, how deeply a secular, humanist, materialist view is actually, my, my image of it is kind of editing your life as you go along and leaving lots of it out. Yeah. Um, that it, it kind of creates a box for us to live in. Like we, you know, we have this idea of the imagination, but even our idea of the imagination doesn't allow for the sacred, does it? It's sort of got a, a glass ceiling. Yeah, that's right. And I think, I think that infects Western Buddhism mm. uh, as well. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a grand statement to make, I know, but I, I've been practicing for uh, uh, well, a few decades now, and I do see more and more uh, Buddhists who uh, are Buddhists, as it were, but they still have a. Um, uh, they they don't really believe that there's something beyond matter, beyond the body, beyond the death of the body, uh, and and that then, I think, will limit. Um, what they can experience. I don't know what somebody like that understands as enlightenment, mm. because mm. enlightenment is meant to be freedom from the round of birth and death and rebirth and redeath. I mean, that's one way of putting it. So if you don't have that round, if it is just birth and then it's death, lights go out, I don't know what enlightenment means. Mm. Well, Sabuti said, if, we, if you have that view, you, you reduce Buddhism to a kind of um, you know, adjustment therapy, adjustment where you therapy. adjust yourself, you know, clean up your act, so that you, you relate better to you know, the, a material world. You know. Yeah, yeah. And that is the danger, isn't it, of Western yeah. Buddhism. There was another... Oliver. Yeah, this is a question about the application of the idea. So if... Um, matter arises from existence in consciousness. Um, and you've spoken a little bit about how um, Bhante created Triyakrasa, and you, you mentioned a little bit about the difficulties of that. Um, would you say something about how can we use this idea of resistance from consciousness in our own personal creativity? Mm. Yeah. I think it's resistance. I'm not sure it's resistance. So I repeat it. So yeah, oh, yeah. He, he, you know, Oliver's saying, how can we use resistance in our own personal practice? Yes. That, you know, yeah. I think he's saying matter is a form of resistance mm. to consciousness. I mean, what strikes me, and you, you, you might want to say more, is you talk about form, don't you? Mm. When you're when you're writing poetry, mm. that's a sort of resistance, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Go on then. <laughs> <laughs> no, <you're talking. laughs> um, well, it is striking, isn't it, that um, people think that form uh, is sort of a, an inhibit, inhibitor, you know, like that form, you have to squeeze yourself into a form. Form actually create is creative. Uh, you know, like in, in writing poems, for instance, you know, if you try to write a sonnet, that the, the wonder of a sonnet is that it can, because it resists you, it, it, 
its, its actual value is that you can't say what you want to say because you've got to get to that rhyme word. So it, 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 it resists you and you come up with something at best if it's the right form that's more creative than you could say if you just wrote it out. And what strikes me is that tree ratna is a form. Yeah. And it resists you in certain places. There are certain things about it that you, that you won't like, you know, I, I, like I would never have done a solitary retreat had I not been involved in tree ratna. I would never have gone on a men's event that's just for a, a single sex event. There are parts of our form that resist what you'd naturally like to do. And I think that at best brings out more creativity from you. I remember this one time with my uh, poetry mentor, she said, I, I think this is, this is trying to be a sestina. And, you know, I had to run home and work out, find out what a sestina was. But it's, it is quite miraculous. You then try and set it as a sestina form, which is a complex fixed form. And it makes you come up with something deeper than you could have done if you just wrote out how you feel. The assumption now is that freedom is freedom just to let it all hang out, say what I feel. Whereas actually, I think to be really creative, you need resistance. And I was wondering whether aesthetic resistance and finding the right level of resistance goes all the way through reality. I mean, there's something I, I, I really liked what, what you just said and what he was saying in Madhulkris last night about, you know, that myth of creation that he talked about. Um, from the Kabbalah. There's something about those sorts of myths and metaphors, which I sort of, uh, which stir me in, in the, you know, if you asked, if, if, if Buddhism is right and consciousness is more primary than matter and, and form, you can't help but ask, well, why is there form at all? Why is there matter at all, particularly when matter seems to be associated with so much pain? You know, why have we got form at all? Why is there anything? Why isn't it? And I, I mean, Buddhism doesn't give you answers to those why questions. Hmm. But the, the, the metaphor that sometimes I've heard is that this phenomenal world of form, of matter, of, of individualized coagulations or crystallizations in this this stream uh, are the creative play of 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 that of reality of one mind of this we are the play of it so that somehow to create what does that mean that we, can you get i don't know what it means uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think i think what i mean uh well, why, there, there could be nothing, couldn't there? Mm. Uh, mm. But there isn't nothing. Um, uh, certainly in, in um, uh, one tradition of Buddhism, it's said that, you know, awareness is the, is the sort of primal reality, not your awareness or my awareness, but mm. awareness itself, or somehow a universal awareness. And all this phenomenal world is like, like the, the, the play of that. Uh, a bit like um, if, you, if you have... Uh, the surface of an ocean, you've got all these waves and ripples on the surface with the light, the sunlight maybe dancing on them. Underneath, it's just deep down, it's completely still maybe. Mm. The surface play is perhaps what this is, mm. is what we think we are. Mm. D does that make sense? Mm. Uh, and what's particular about our life in that? Because one of the issues must be not just whether life is meaningful, but is my particular life meaningful? Well, this, and I don't know how much time we've got. Cause this is perhaps drawing to a close, I think. Do, last night he was talking and I was asking him about the one and the many, and I don't know how clear all of that was, because it's easier if you've read the book. But he, Ian McGilchrist, was sort of saying, you know, you, you get these sort of statements, spiritual statements, like all is one. Well, Buddhism doesn't say that, yeah. uh, and yet it says it's not that there's complete separation either. Mm. Uh, we definitely have individualized lives and forms. That's what he meant by the many. There is multiplicity mm. and uniqueness mm. going on. We're not just one sort of cosmic soup. 
uh, at the same time, the many are, are not separate, they're not individualized and boundaried mm. in the way that we assume they are. Mm. Uh, they are like whirlpools in the stream of life, mm. uh, which have their own shape, but really they're not apart from the water. So that maybe is part of the, 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 the kind of wonder of it all, that there is an individualized life, which isn't really as separate as we think. I mean, why write many poems? Do, do you know what I mean? You've, mm. you've written, there are loads of sonnets out there. Why write another one? Mm. I often ask them this. Because of creativity. Mm. Do, do, mm. do you see what I mean? And, uh, mm. uh, uh, so maybe that's what form is. Maybe that's what our lives are. Life wants to be. Cre he he says that you know that when you look at life, it's it's beauty and order that he sees and creativity and creativity yeah. and Bante putting so much emphasis on creativity. Mm. He uses that word again and again and again. Yeah, the know. creative mind. Mm. Let's finish there. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, thank you.